morning everyone. I'm happy to welcome you to today's session where we talk about the renowned short story by Borges titled The Garden of Forking Paths. Borges was born in 1899 and he lived till 1986. He's considered as one of the best storytellers of the 20th century and his works have now received much critical acclaim and international attention. He was an Argentine short story writer, an essayist, a poet and a translator. He wrote in Spanish language and the works that are available to us are in the form of the translations from Spanish to English. He is said to have been one of the pioneers of the magic realist movement in the 20th century Latin American literature. It said that he went blind at the age of 55, but the kind of output, the literary output that he left behind was prolific. In, uh, by 1960s, he was a, a well-known figure in the international literary scene. His works began to be translated and published widely in America and Europe. This could also be seen as part of the Latin American boom. Uh, it is said about Borges that he more than anyone renovated the language of fiction and thus opened the way to a remarkable generation of Spanish-American novelists. He is certainly considered as one of the greatest storytellers and the best short story writers who had ever lived. The story that we are today looking at, The Garden of Walking Paths, it was originally written in 1941. This was republished in 1944 in Borges' collection of short stories titled Fictions. It was translated into English by 1948 and the translation was done by Anthony Boucher. The translation appeared first in Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, which was not a highbrow literary uh, magazine, but it was a pulp fiction periodical. It's just another irony of literary history and criticism that the work which was initially published as a detective fiction in one of uh, the pulp fiction periodicals, it went on to become one of the greatest canonical works ever. This incidentally was also first of Borges' works to be translated into English. The story itself is written in first person narrative, it's in the form of a deposition. There are multiple perspectives from which we can access this short story. It has lent itself to a lot of modern critical uh, uh, theoretical practices. It's been seen as a work that predated postmodernism even before postmodernism actually began in the 1960s. It's considered as one of the earliest representations of magic realist narrative. Deleuze and Guattari, uh, their uh, framework of the rhizomes can be used to talk about this work. The, the fragmentariness with which the story is narrated and the labyrinthine structure in which the plot unfolds. Those are the things which have received utmost attention as far as the critical acclaim and response is considered. We however begin taking a look at the story by doing a close reading of this work. It's not a, the kind of a story which would readily give away its meaning or its summary. When you go through the story yourself, you will realize that it employs an unconventional narrative form. And that is not the form of a conventional story. It does not begin somewhere and it does not have the usual elements which are part of a story. To appreciate this work better, I would like to take you through a close reading of uh, uh, this story, which would also help you to identify different elements and different segments, which would, the, the many parts which would make the whole. Soon after the title, The Garden of Walking Paths, we find this uh, to Victoria Ocampo. Victoria Ocampo was a South American herself, but she was also the, uh, 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 an activist and also a patron of what is now considered as the uh, golden period of Argentina's uh, literary age. And uh, the work begins in the form of a historical narrative. There's a reference to uh, the history of the World War. There's a citation from page 212. It talks about certain events which had happened during the First World War. We get to know that through the age, uh, through the year which is given here, 1916. And we know that this, this story is in the form of a deposition at just like this, uh, these prefatory remarks would tell us. The following deposition dictated by Red Rover and then signed by Dr. Yusun. He is the one who is narrating this. He is a former teacher of English and uh, 
it also tells us at the outset by way of uh, the some details given by this manuscript editor that the first two pages are missing. So the narration begins almost from the middle of a sentence when Yusun, a narrator, Dr. Yusun, who was a former English teacher, he begins to narrate this deposition. And he is recalling a telephonic conversation at the outset, which is that of Captain Richard Madden. And uh, Richard Madden, and we, are, and we are also being told that Victor uh, Runebug, he had been arrested or murdered. And there is a footnote, there is an end note, which we can see over here. And this is again yet another thing, which is not really part of a short story, not conventionally part of a short story. When we come towards the end of the story, we find this end note here, just like you would find in a research paper, a malicious and outlandish statement. In point of fact, Captain Richard Madden had been attacked by the Prussian spy Hans Rabina, alias Victor Runebuck, who drew an automatic pistol when Madden appeared with orders for the spy's arrest. Madden in self-defense had inflicted wounds, of which the spy died later. Note by the manuscript editor. So we also get to know that this entire story in the form of a deposition is made is made available to us by this manuscript editor who's not named so the story needs to be understood the facts and the many representations needs to be seen in this context this right at the outset we get a taste of how unconventional this narrative is and how it presents fiction as if it is real as if it is research material and at the outset it's itself Yusun, our narrator, is also telling us that he runs the same risk of being arrested or of getting arrested or being murdered. And who is Captain Richard Madden? He's an Irishman in the service of England and uh, it is also, uh, a ref there is also a reference to two agents of Imperial Germany. So we get to know that the one who has already died, Victor Runeberg and Yusun, the narrator, both of them are agents of Imperial Germany. They are currently working as a spy in England where exactly the location is, we will get to know shortly. Um, here we also get to know that he's, he has a chief, he's working, Yusun is working under a chief and there's a certain information that he needs to pass on to the chief. And this is how the chief is uh, being described towards the end of the first page. The year of that sick and hateful man who knew nothing of Runeberg or of me except that we were in Staffordshire. Staffordshire is in England. So this is the setting is in England in Staffordshire and uh, the year is 1916. This is during the period of the First World War where our narrator Yusun is working as a spy for Germany and now he's being pursued by Richard Madden who is an Irishman himself but he's now working for England and Yusun as the name itself suggests he is Chinese. And knowing that he is being pursued by Richard Madden, we uh, find that Yusun is developing a plan. And we do not get to know what the plan exactly is. The entire story is about this plan unfolding. And as a first step of this plan, we find Yusun going through the telephone directory. He picks up the name of one person who is capable of passing on the information, how we would get to know as the story progresses. And there is a brief reflection about why he is doing this, why he is doing this spy work. And he says that he is not doing it for Germany. No, such a barbarous country is of no importance to me, particularly since it had degraded me by making me, some, making me become a spy. Furthermore, I knew an Englishman, a modest man, who for me is as great as Goethe. I did not speak with him for more than an hour, but during that time he was Goethe. Towards the end of the story, we will get to know that he is referring to a person whom he would meet and who would become central to the way this story unfolds. And this is something that we reserve. This suspense is something that we hold on to now. It's reserved towards the uh, end of the story. He also pointedly and very directly tells us why he decided to carry out this plan. That's because he wished to prove that a yellow man could save his armies. He is giving us some insider information about the many stereotypical notions that the Germans had of the Chinese. And he, here is Yusin, a Chinese man who is working as a German spy in England. 
and he is doing this. He is carrying out this plan to a meticulous perfection, even at the cost of many things. It is because he wanted to prove to his chief, who is German, that a yellow man could save his armies, that a yellow man could save the German armies. So we do find a subtle work of racism and certain ways in which uh, racial superiority gets asserted here. He decided to go to the village of Ashgrove. That was the detail that he was looking up in the telephone directory we get to know. But just when the train is about to leave the platform, he also realizes much to his shock that Captain Richard Madden is still pursuing him. Though he feels elated that he had won the first encounter, um, he realizes that Madden is right behind him. And the, the narrow escape that he had at that point of time from Richard Madden, he describes that as a precious accident. He reaches Ashgrove Station and just when he gets out of the train, much to his surprise, there are a group of children who are playing and one of them walks up to him and asks, are you going to Dr. Stephen Albert's house? This is something that would take the reader also by surprise because he's a spy. No one knows about his plan and that's a plan that he made up, that he conceived when he was sitting in that hotel room and going through that uh, uh, telephone directory. And how on earth did those children come to know that he is going to Stephen Albert's house? They also take it for granted that he is going to Stephen Albert's house and without waiting for any response, they, gives out the, uh, they give out the directions to Stephen Albert's house. And now we also know that he was actually looking up Dr. Stephen Albert's uh, house address and number when he was going through the telephone directory. And look at the way the directions are being given. He catches on something very significant and uh, seemingly material from the way the direction is given. The, one of the children tells him the house is a good distance away but you won't get lost if you take the road to the left and bear to the left at every cross road. And this direction which asks him to keep to the left, that provokes, that invokes a different kind of a memory in his mind. We find that he associates that immediately with, certain, with a certain common formula for finding the central courtyard of certain labyrinths as he puts it and that makes him to make another random association of that of uh, Sui Pen and he also reveals a little more intimate personal details about him including this reference that not for nothing am I the great grandson of Sui Pen and who was Sui Pen? He was the governor of uh, Yunnan and gave up temporal power to write a novel with more characters than there are in uh, Hung Lu Meng and to create a maze in which all men would lose themselves. He spent 13 years on these oddly assorted tasks before he was assassinated by a stranger. His novel had no sense to it and nobody ever found his labyrinth. This passage is extremely important. It is one of those passages which also gives away the summary of the story in a certain way. It's, there, is a, uh, there is a certain prophetic nature a certain foreshadowing of the events that are to follow in this passage. We will certainly come back to it after we go through the entire story to see these uh, connections which are given to us in different points as the story progresses. It is up to the reader to ultimately make these connections and tie up the loose ends. And this knowledge to which we are being made privy to that he is a grand grandson of Sweet Pen and that there is a certain obsession with labyrinths about a certain novel uh, about a maze which Sweepen was supposedly writing. These will become extremely important as the, uh, uh, as the narrative progresses. Spend some time thinking about this mythical labyrinth, totally oblivious to the fact that he is actually fleeing now. There is Captain Richard Madden who is pursuing him. He can get arrested. He also runs the risk of getting killed and here we find Yusun, in spite of these, meditating about the mythical labyrinth. And suddenly he also realizes, lost in these imaginary illusions, I forgot my destiny, that of the hunted. He is back to the contemporary. He is trying to find his way to Stephen Albert's house. Given the nature of his work, being a spy, which is a very uncertain occupation, and given the political and historical background of those times, which is the First World War. 
we also find him ruminating about the idea of how enemies are made and his own thoughts his own observations on those things i thought that a man might be an enemy of other men of the differing moments of other men but never an enemy of a country not of five lights words gardens streams or the west wind we do find usun at least momentarily meditating upon the futility of the task that he is about to embark on he is there caught in that moment in time because there are certain countries who are being presented as enemies of one another the spy work that he is doing and the mission that he is about to uh, complete now uh, in in stephen albert's house those are all, those are all part of this large creation of uh, countries being enemies of one another those are all after effects and uh, they are all even victims under this circumstance which presents different nations as enemies and he quite rationally but in a futile way questions what the fundamental basis is of these creations of uh, enmity these constructions of enmity and meditating thus we find him arriving at his destination and he is listening to chinese music which he is also surprised about and uh, and we find him entering the house of dr stephen albert he opened the gate and spoke slowly in my language and we find that again much to the reader's surprise stephen albert was also expecting yusun but of course he has uh, not really understood who yusun is he refers to him as uh, uh, si peng i see that the word is si peng has troubled himself to trouble himself to see to relieving my solitude no doubt you want to see the garden and that's the name of one of uh, their consuls yusun recognizes remember there is a connection that he had already referred to of his great grandfather sui pen being the governor of a certain province and the position which he also gives up to pursue a certain other things about a novel and a maze and uh, there is a reference to the title here the garden of fucking paths and this may seem very bizarre and surreal to the reader but we find that it stood something in yusun's memory now we find him making a reference again to his great grandfather sui pen and this garden the garden of fucking paths that stephen albert is referring to is the garden of his ancestor sui pen and the story ta- takes a complete turn and twist from this point of time onwards we find a turning point this moment could be identified as a turning point and we find stephen albert also getting really interested in meeting someone who is the blood relation of this illustrious ancestor and soon after we get to know a little more details about stephen albert he also introduces him we the story also introduces him as a sinologist which also explains his interest and his knowledge in what sui pen a chinese man had done in one of the earlier decades as in when they sit down to talk about things which are not even remotely connected to what yusun does not related to war not related to spy work they are talking about sui pen and a chinese ancestor they are talking about novels gardens and mazes but at the back of his mind uh, yusun also realizes that he is actually waiting for his pursuer richard madden to arrive and there is barely an hour for him yeah. now i want you to see this connection with one of the earlier statements that yusun makes about an hour that he had spent with an englishman and now we get to know that that englishman is stephen albert and he is being equated with gethe the greatest literary master from germany there is a reference to an irrevocable decision the decision has already been made we get to know we will get to know later that the decision was made the moment he started going through the telephone directory to identify that one person who could pass on a significant piece of information to his chief in germany and he is again referring to that irrevocable decision what that irrevocable decision we will get to know only towards the end we find stephen albert and yusun speaking at length about sui pen 
how he left his uh, highly successful life and career to pursue something seemingly uh, absurd to write a novel to create a maze and this novel was totally incomprehensive and and in the words of Yusun uh, uh, those of the blood of sweep and they still curse the memory of that monk who had in fact you know revived one of the uh, manuscripts which was found such a publication was madness the book is a shapeless mass of contradictory rough drafts i examined it once upon a time the hero dies in the third chapter while in the fourth he is alive this is a clear reference to the postmodern narrative form which borges himself was very fascinated in exploring as mentioned at the outset of this lecture this is a work that predates the event of postmodernism within the critical ambience there was not much discussion of postmodernism when borges was writing this short story but we get to know that this is a story which gets conveniently situated within the postmodern rhetoric and this is one of the giveaways in this uh, uh, short story where there is a reference to another work which is written in a postmodern way there is a reference to uh, another work which is totally incomprehensible because there are contradictory things happening because it is a series of narration which defies all kinds of logic and reason and we find them continuing to talk about the labyrinth a labyrinth is a key image and a symbol in most of borges short stories he likes to playfully use the idea of labyrinth to situate his fictional enterprises and we find this continuing obsession getting ex- exemplified in this story the garden of fucking paths as well and uh stephen albert he refers to himself as a barbarous englishman who have been who has been given the key to solving the mystery of this labyrinth which sweep and created in the first place and uh, we are also being uh given certain important information such as sweep ends book and the labyrinth being one and the same how this has an implication in this narration and in the larger scheme of things is something we shall come back to look at at a later point and there is a letter a fragment of a letter rather which uh, stephen albert refers to and he identifies that fragment of a letter written by sweepen as a key to understanding this novel and also the maze the garden that uh, sweepen initially wanted to create we have a reference to sweepen's calligraphy was being being justly famous which also implies that he was perhaps a very well known statesman initially and a well known artist in his uh, province and if you remember if you recall the way sweepen was initially introduced he was the governor of uh, yanan a province in china he gives that up he gives that position he gives that status to pursue certain meaningless things and he is seen as a as a crazy fellow he is seen as someone who went down deep into madness because the product the novel that he created was in a deep mess of uh, in- incomprehensible things and sweepen whether sweepen was famous for his achievements or for these uh, seemingly uh, erratic choices that he made in his life that is something that we do not get to know but we do find that in the course of this story we find uh yusun the narrator finding a new found respect for his ancestor whom he had referred to dismissively in at the outset of the narration and here we come back to look at this letter which stephen albert is referring to it has these uh, significant words i leave to various future times but not to all my garden of walking paths this is another key which can be used to open and und- uh, and and uh, reveal the meaning of the text if at all the text has a central meaning and this is a uh, an oft quoted uh statement from Borges writings as well and the next few passages they tell us about the painstaking efforts that Stephen Albert had undertaken to understand this text 
there is a reference to the Thousand and One Nights, a text which Stephen Albert thinks is useful in trying to analyze a work such uh, that of Sui Pence. He also refers to the uh, manuscripts that he received from Oxford, indicating his scholarly, at, indicating the scholarly attention that he had been paying for this work. And again, a reiteration of a point that he made a little earlier, The Garden of Forking Paths was a chaotic novel itself. The maze and the novel, the garden and the novel, they are one. They are not two separate things. The significance of this identification is something that we need to take a look at in detail shortly. And he begins to unpack this phrase to various future times but not to all. And Stephen Albert is trying to explain to Yusun that this refers to the image of bifurcating in time and not in space. He is talking about the possibility of choosing different time slots at the same time. And this perhaps is the cause of contradictions in the novel. These kinds of narrations are certainly part of many postmodern narratives. We do have novels which do not begin anywhere storylines which contradict each other and it's a certain kind of a foreshadowing in that sense that this story and the story that it is referring to is doing over here. Stephen Albert also refers to the various possible outcomes. When you come to the end of the story, we will know that this by extension can be used to talk about the many choices that the narrator, the Yusin, is also taking at different points of time. From the moment he realized that he needs to flee, from the moment that he realizes that Stephen Madden is pursuing him, there are a set of choices, there are a series of choices that he takes. And based on the kind of choices that he takes, the outcome could be different. But in a real life scenario, like that of Yusun's, one can only make one choice. Only that one single choice is available to you. Only that the only the implications of the choice which is made is available to you. But the story that Stephen Albert is referring to, the story that uh, Yusun's ancestor uh, Sui Pen attempted to write refers to, they are talking about the possibility of inhabiting different futures and perhaps all futures at the same time and engage with all possible outcomes at the same time. And this is what perhaps differentiates the life that the narrator Yusun is leading from that of the fictional narrative that his ancestor sweep and had tried to create and recreate. We go through a section where Stephen Albert is reading out certain segments from this, uh, uh, the, the older novel, the one written by sweep and, and we find him, Yusun, attentively listening to this uh, uh, narration, this rendition. And Stephen Albert also refers to a brief history of novel in China. He talks about the 13 years which the others think um, Sui Pen had wasted in writing a novel. And then he also refers to how in your country the novel is an inferior genre. In Sui Pen's period it was a despised one. Here we also need to be attentive to the genre which under which uh, this work, The Garden of Forking Paths, was also initially labelled. It was seen as a form of detective fiction. And detective fiction was considered as an inferior genre for a long time. It was not considered as uh, the kind of writing which would require the, the profound uh, depth and philosophical nature, which were part of the other well-known, uh, well-written works. So detective fiction was the kind of genre with which the Garden of Walking Paths was associated with. In spite of that, we find that the novel, this short story went on to become one of the canonical works. So here there's a reference to the history of the novel in different parts of the world. And we do find these scholarly discussions also enriching the understanding of this uh, short story. And now Stephen Albert is referring to the Garden of Walking Paths, the original work by Sui Pen as an enormous guessing game. He asks, uh, Yusun, this important question, which this important question, which would also resolve the riddle that the story is in a guessing game to which the answer is chess. Which word is the only one prohibited? 
I thought for a moment and then replied, the word is chess. And he uses this as a key to unlock the meaning of this text. And then he goes on to say, I have translated the whole work. I can state categorically that not once has the word time been used in the whole book. He's referring to this whole book, the whole novel, which, is, which he has been researching on for the last many years. And he states categorically that the one word that is not mentioned in this entire work is time. And time becomes the significant thing to unlock the meaning of this work as well. And there are ref references to Newton and Schopenhauer. And the, those are certain things that we shall come back to take a uh, look at to understand the meaning of this text in a more in a better way and also to situate it in a certain context of uh, historical times. Stephen Albert discusses with Yusun the possibilities of them, Stephen Albert and Yusun, sharing different futures in different possible, uh, sh sharing different relations in different possible futures. But nevertheless, Yusun responds to him with gratitude and says, in all of them, in all those futures that I possibly share with you, I deeply appreciate and am grateful to you for the restoration of Sui Pen's garden. And as and when this profound discussion is going on about past, about history, about novels, about time, about the meaning making process, which is extremely important as far as such an ancient text like Sui Pen's Garden of Walking Paths is concerned. In the middle of this discussion, again, we find Yusun getting jolted back into reality where Captain Richard Madden is pursuing him. So this is, this is the kind of magical realism that um, Borges is using. We are being transformed from one kind of a narration to a totally different kind of one, from a surreal magical realist kind of narration to a more realist grounded thing in, 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 a, in a fairly seamless fashion. We do not even know, we don't, the, the, the reader do not get to feel that the shifts were random or absurd. And here Yusun is being jolted back to this reality that Captain Richard Madden is pursuing him. And what happens next? Well, take the reader with shock and surprise. Albert rose from his seat. He stood up tall as he opened the top drawer of the high writing cabinet. For a moment, his back was again turned to me. I had the revolver ready. I fired with the utmost care. Albert fell without a murmur. At once, I swear that his death was instantaneous, as if he had been struck by a lightning. What an anticlimax, a reader would think. Here we are, in the middle of a discussion, which talks about a certain ancestor, a certain work on which Stephen Albert was researching and we all of a sudden find after expressing his uh, um, gratitude to Stephen Albert, we find Yusun killing Stephen Al Albert and we do not have any context for this killing we think but now I, I again want you to go back and look at the first part of the story where at the beginning Yusun is looking for a name a name, a person who would pass on this significant information to the chief. And he's talking about a certain mission that he needs to complete, a plan that he needs to execute so that he can convey certain information and also prove to the chief, to the German chief, that a yellow man can save the German armies. So how does this plan work out? And towards the end, we do not find any more riddles. And now we find after the death of Stephen Albert, the story comes to almost an abrupt end. I read to you the final paragraph. What remains is unreal and unimportant. Madden broke in and arrested me. I have been condemned to hang. Abominably, I have yet triumphed. The secret name of the city to be attacked got through to Berlin. Yesterday it was bombed. I read the news in the same English newspapers which were trying to resolve the riddle of the murder of the learned Sinologist Stephen Albert by the unknown Yusun. The chief, however, had already solved this mystery. He knew that my problem was to shout with my feeble voice about the tumult of war in the name of the city called Albert, and that I had no other course open to me than to kill someone of that name. 
he does not know for no one can of my infinite penitence and sickness of the heart in this final paragraph we get to know that it's such a brilliantly crafted story now many of the things which appear to have happened at random now it begins to make sense to us the entire puzzle begins to fit into its place when yusun was going through the telephone directory he had in his mind this piece of information which needs to be passed on to his chief that was the name of this city named albert albert is a city and this how would he pass this information on to the chief the one plan that he had in mind was to find the name of a to find a person of the same name albert and then kill him captain madden is already pursuing him and it's fairly certain that richard madden will either kill him or get him arrested so in that case since he already knows that he there is no escape for him the least he could do is to shout out the name of this city through the name of the person that he assassinates and make this a major event a news so that it would also reach his chief the things that happened in between the brief encounter that stephen albert had with yusun that perhaps was not within the plan but we do find that also sitting in very well to take the plot ahead and also allowing us to engage in a lot of discussions which are not otherwise part of this story which is about spy work about murder about wars about giving information the information of the spy to the one who had commissioned him so it is a kind of a story which brings in these otherwise disconnected elements in a seemingly connected fashion looking at the story we will realize that there are many authorial voices here that be anonymous historian the manuscript editor use in the narrator and even the author himself so how reliable are these many voices given that then this is in the form of a deposition there is one cannot ignore even this possibility that being a spy yusun is perhaps uh trying to uh make up some of those things maybe those are figments of his imagination but still given that yusun is a dying man he's awaiting his death sentence he knows his certain future which is which is perhaps you know few more hours or days given that he knows that he's about to die perhaps we also need to take him more seriously given that it's also a note from a dying man we also need to take a look at some of the important aspects which have been critically looked at uh, in the context of this work that we shall be doing in the following session we wrap up this discussion for today i thank you for listening and i look forward to seeing you in the next session